be with everybody here in this room. Genesis chapter 32. Let me <clears throat> just somehow give you a little picture that's being painted by the text. Um, Jacob is the subject, and I, I believe that we all can find ourselves in the mirror of Jacob's life. We all have similar struggles. We all have similar challenges. We all face giants in our lives that we need to defeat. We all face deceit that wants to creep up, the advantage sometimes of telling a lie or decept deception can sometimes creep into our thought process. We see that in ourselves in the life of Jacob, but we also see that there's a great God on Jacob's side. We see that there's a great God that's fighting for him, and there's a great God that's fighting with him, but Jacob has to go through the process of understanding that that God needs to be reached out for and that that God is waiting patiently while we exhaust ourselves of all of our endeavors, chasing our own dreams down our own paths. God patiently waits for us uh, on the sidelines until we finally are willing to reach out for him. We read in Genesis 32 at the beginning, it says, and Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanim, double encampment. He understood that he had landed there with all of his encampment. But that word means that he also acknowledged that God's host came to that place to meet him. He's in the midst of a supernatural experience. It's unforgettable angelic visitation. If he's ever wondered if God was on his side, he knew now. If he ever questioned God's commitment to his promises, I'll never leave you or forsake you, he knew then that God had not left him alone ever. If he ever thought that he was alone, now he knew that God abides with him. Let, let, let's just kind of lay the setting for the scripture for a few moments. Almost an entire generation has come since Jacob left home. It's been 20 years since he pulled the goat skins over his hands to pull the wool over his aging father's eyes. The birthright and blessing were his by cunning and deceit. But if he stayed there in his home with his mom and his father who was ailing, he knew that death was inevitable as soon as his father died. So he flees the wrath of his brother Esau to Bethel. That angelic visitation in the ladder to heaven on his layover to Laban's house was an indicator that God hadn't forgotten him, that he hadn't gone too far, but that God was still active and at work on his side. He'd reap his own deceit and end up with two wives for 14 years of work, but God's, hands, God's hand released blessing into his life. The blessing of Abraham and Isaac that had been declared over him was being released to him. He was reaping the benefits. He was wiser and wealthier, but without a doubt, he was wondering if he would make it past the next pitfall of meeting his brother Esau. Would Esau's pent-up rage be released in a moment and his life ended? It was two decades. It was more than those 14 years of work that worried him in this moment? Would it be a fight to the finish? Would there be a brotherly clash? Would they end up one leaving and one dying? He didn't know. He was full of questions. Will I win over Esau or will Esau win over me? Will we reconcile? What should I do now? How can I soothe the pain of the past? Where do I go from here? And, and Jacob, with all of the questions that are being produced by the problem in his life, develops an elaborate plan. Does anybody see yourself in Jacob? Does anybody know sometimes that, that you've got the past that can come to haunt you? You don't know what to do with it. You don't know where to turn next. You're doing everything you can. You, you're you're kind of, you've got a whole weight, a load of history that, that, that seems to be against you, right? Does anybody ever, ever kind of wrestle with that a little bit? Anyone ever wrestle? I know there's just a couple honest among us. We wrestle with that a little bit, but Jacob comes up with an elaborate plan. The, the problem is, is that when we come up with the plan on our own, often it's not the right plan. There is. The, the title of the lesson tonight, if you looked at my notes and they can verify in the back, is it, simply this. There is no substitute for prayer. There's simply no substitute for prayer. 
There's no substitute for prayer. There's no option that you can come up with on your own. There's no elaborate plan or method or or, or idea that you can create on your own that can ever take the place of prayer. And and I know the last few weeks we've been unpacking prayer. And Pastor talked to us last week about our prayer personalities. Unpacked our our personality traits and, and helped us see ourselves a little bit clearly. And he did that in his brilliant way. I just come with a simple message tonight. I want someone to realize there's simply no substitute for prayer. That, that, that there, there's no other substitute for it. There, there's no plan. There's no elaborate scheme. There, there's nothing that we can do on our own. It's simply crying out to God. It's simply calling out on God when we need to. That, that is the only option that we're left with. That's the only option we have. But, but just for a minute, let's take a look at, at Jacob and his life. And in Genesis 32 and 1, we already read it. It said, and Jacob went on his way. I, I wonder what way Jacob would have went primarily if he had sought the will of God before he went on his way. L- let me just remind us all that, that the reason that God asks us to pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done, is because our way is an appealing way. And our way seems to be the right way. And our way, when we go our own way, it's often the wrong way. Jacob had been shrewd since he was young. His smarts had bought him the birthright for a mere bowl of pottage. Pretty good deal. I I like a good deal. Anybody else like a good deal? That's a good deal. Birthright for a bowl of pottage. Right time, right place, right food. Right, some would call it an opportunity. He was smart. Jacob was smart. Let's just chalk it up. He, He was brilliant. He's smart. He's smart. He, he's got some smarts. He, he put them to good use, and, and he's got some, some desire in him. He's got, he's got, a, he's got this appeal to, to, to succeed and to go forward and to grow and, and to become. He's got all that. His smarts could make him wealthy, but knowledge is no substitute for prayer. Let me qualify. It, it's important to be educated. Someone shout amen. amen. It's essential that we learn. It's critical that we learn how to work and work well. It's it's critical that we learn how to work smart. It's wonderful to be well-read. It's wonderful to be wise. It's wonderful for us to do all that. But genius is no substitute for time spent alone with God. Our greatest greatest learner, you know, I had a teacher in grade 8, Mr. Pierce. Never forgot him. He was a, a brilliant teacher and and he would, you know, as, as he was teaching, there was times, and, you know, I remember particularly sometimes in math class, because it, it, that was kind of like when the light would come on for some students, and they'd, they'd go, ah. And he'd go, oh, the learning experience. <laughs> you can't hide the learning experience. When, when the learning experience occurs, it's like, oh, ah the learning experience. But, but can I tell you that the learning experience isn't a substitute for the experience of being in God's presence. The learning experience isn't a substitute for that presence of God that meets you in your most dire time of need. The learning experience, I, I'm glad that we can get smart. I'm glad that we can gain knowledge. I'm, I'm glad our brains are wired in a way so we don't have to make the same dumb mistake twice. I'm thankful for that. But our learning experience is no substitute for time spent alone with God. Too often, too many of us are trying to go our own way. Our knowledge, our leadership, our future, our way. We've never had more, let me just, uh, let me just state the obvious. We've never had more information and communication at our disposal, but we have never done less with it than we have now. We've become pawns of information for pondering. But what God needs is someone to generate some power with what they possess. I had this word picked. Yeah, learning experience. (laughs) You know, I was thinking about that, that we have all of this information. And it's sitting in this pond of pondering in our mind. Let Let me wax eloquent. But God's not interested in our pond of pondering. God wants us to get a generator like Mactaquack at the end of that thing and get some power generated because we can have all this knowledge of God and we can understand all these mysteries because of what we've read and what we've understand. But watch when you connect the author with the book or watch when you connect the author with that knowledge. Watch what happens. It's deeper than just information. It moves into this place of revelation. And what happens with revelation is that revelation impacts your situation. 
That's what happens with Revelation. It changes the circumstances. It's more than something written in print on a, on a page. It's more than just something bound in a black book. It's something that's on the inside when you connect the author with that message. That powerful thing happens, and Revelation changes our circumstance and our situation. What God needs is someone to generate power with what? They possess. You have the world's most powerful preachers in your pocket on YouTube. You have commentaries of the largest libraries in the world at your fingertips. But if we don't activate it, if we don't connect it to the author, then it's useless. And that happens in prayer. Pastor talked about praying through the word of God. Why? It connects that, that print on the page to the power of God. And you are in the middle. That power. That knowledge is no substitute for time spent alone with God. Knowledge alone leaves you looking for a way out with your own intelligence. But the old broken down altar is waiting for someone to bring a needed repair and connect to the source of God. Your knowledge, your own intelligence will leave you stuck on the path of your own way. But if you'll think with me, greatest men of women and God universally they may have had knowledge and understanding, but they were people of prayer, period. We can be the greatest theologians. We can put together the greatest sermons and lessons. But if you don't couple it, if we don't couple it with prayer, it's just information. We, we can have the greatest source of knowledge at our fingertips, but unless we connect it to the source, it's, it's just information. That's why we need to release the power of prayer in our lives. You take that same man and that same woman that has all that information and you season that information with prayer and you'll see tremendous transformation happen in them and through them. Don't make the same mistake as Jacob and attempt to substitute knowledge for prayer. It just won't work. Don't go your own way. Number two, Jacob substitutes numbers for prayer. Can I state this? Without any axe to grind, your popularity doesn't matter to God. Your, your perceived level of influence doesn't impress him. Your followers online or in life doesn't make him think that you're important. Period. It doesn't matter. Numbers don't impress God. As a matter of fact, David found out the hard way that God didn't want the population statistics of his army calculated and distributed. Gideon found out that sometimes God works best by divine subtraction. Samaria found out that four leprous men could, could rout an entire army. That's what happens when we don't get focused on numbers. So don't let numbers determine and become a substitute for prayer. I'm grateful for a great church. But I hate talking about the size of our church sometimes because it's too big for some and it's too small for others. The fact is the size of our membership isn't important. The number of lost in our city is. That's the most important number. And Jesus already set the stage by telling us that it's okay to leave the 99 to find the one that's lost. He would rather us be looking for one. That one is more important than 99 that are found. And that is why we can't get focused on numbers. If we want to get focused on numbers, let's focus on the number of the lost. Let's focus on what's left to reach. Let's focus on the population statistic versus the church calendar and the church membership role. Let's focus on those numbers for a little while. Because Jacob, he, he tried to rely on the number of people that were with him. He tried to rely on his possessions. He tried to look at his maidservants and look at the number of the flock that he had. He tried to look at all of his goats and his sheep. And he tried to accumulate and assess what, what exactly he possessed. It was all about the numbers. And the numbers don't even matter. Numbers don't matter. What matters is your relationship with God. Don't, don't, don't make the mistake that Jacob did and start looking around at what we've got and, and the things that we have, whether here in this room or in your own room. That doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what we have. What matters is can we connect somebody to God and can we connect to God? That is what truly matters. The third thing that Jacob tries to substitute for prayer is, is his wealth. And I, I leaned a little bit in on that in the last 
comment, Genesis 32 and verse 4, he said, he commanded them saying, thus shall ye speak unto my Lord Esau. He, he's, he's prepping his people for this conversation, this conflict that's going to happen with his brother that he hasn't seen for 20 years. He's preparing the minds of his people. He, he's wanting to put his best foot forward. He's, he, he's maybe wanting to intimidate Esau. He, he's wanting to make sure that he's not going to go down without fighting. Jacob is doing this all so far in his own power. Let me, let me just go through here. He, he said, here's what you're going to say to Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus. I've sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now, and I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servant and women servant, and I've sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Maybe, maybe he thought he'd do the trade. My life, you take my stuff, but leave my family, leave my life. Maybe he, but he's trying to substitute wealth in this circumstance, in this situation. He, he's trying to let it be the forerunner of who he is and what he is, but wealth can't take you there. Wealth is, let me tell you why the wealth substitute won't work. Wealth is a worldly commodity. The enemy offered it to Christ in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. Now, I didn't get a lot of amens there because some of us are thinking about our bank accounts. The money that God puts in our hands is a test at best. And prosperity, perhaps. God loves to give gifts to his children. That's just the way God is. He, he loves it. However, it is not the signature of his blessing. That's not the signature of God's blessing. Our possessions aren't the signature of God's blessing. And, and Jacob, in this instance, he's trying to let that be the substitute for prayer in his life. He's trying to let that substitute his relationship with God. He, he doesn't need to do all that. And neither do we. We don't need all that. Watch what happens in this field power play by Jacob in Genesis 32 and verse 6. If, if you're following along, you can read with me. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee. And 400 men with him. It, this power play that Jacob was assuming would be in his favor. Or he didn't know what Esau possessed, but now all of a sudden Esau's got 400 men. Men with him. And both of these guys are in this power play of who is greater. And let me tell you why that's a flawed outlook. Let, that, that, let, me, let me just remind us. That's why our relationship with God has to be de deeply linked to what we are, not to what we have. Our relationship with God has got to be deeply linked to what we are and not what we have. We are his children. Amen. We have been purchased by him. We have to come to the point where we will trust him with whatever money is in the bank or trust him with just the clothes on our back. Regardless, we must Trust God. And when you try and substitute wealth for prayer, it doesn't work. But when you institute prayer, then God can release blessing in your life because you are a conduit. You're a pipe that releases what God wants to give to you and through you to those around you. Trust God. Don't let wealth become the substitute for prayer. In the fourth part of this lesson, Jacob substitutes organization and planning and preparation for prayer. He's well organized. We mentioned earlier that he's shrewd, he's, he's smart, he's, he's genius. He's got all these things, all of his ducks in a row. It says in Genesis 32 and verse 7, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands and he said if Esau come to the one company and smite it then the other company which is left shall escape he he's kind of getting everything in order and he's he's putting his best again Jacob is going his own way he's leaning on his own knowledge he's he's resting on his own understanding what would i do if i was in that situation but we're in pretty serious circumstances in his life right now. And we have yet 
to see Jacob turn to God. We, we, we've had this supernatural experience. The angels of the Lord have shown up. We're, we're right here in this moment with Jacob. And now he's fearful because Esau's got 400 men with him. And he's fearful because Esau's powerful. And Esau, he doesn't know his heart. He doesn't know Esau's heart. And still Jacob is walking his own path, trying to create his own purpose and trying to create his own plan. He's organizing and he's, he's and, and I think you know where I'm going. I appreciate systems. I appreciate planning and organization. We're printing off planning calendars today. We have our planning retreat next weekend. We need to be organized. We need to be structured. I'm grateful that I knew that I was on the schedule for tonight, long before tonight. And so are you. I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful for that. We need all that. But our systems and our planning and our organization cannot become the substitute for prayer. Our best efforts cannot trump travail. Our best schedules cannot substitute supplication. And our best plans cannot replace prayer. Finally, after four attempts, Jacob puts the pieces of the prayer puzzle finally together. In Genesis chapter 32 and verse 9, it says, and Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham. What a difference. Can you feel the difference in the scripture? The story takes a whole new setting. The tone of everything changes in our mind, in our spirit. We, we connect with that. We, 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 we sense the, oh, what is it? It's the friction. We sense the the trouble. We sense all that up into this moment. We, we, we feel that anger of Esau. We feel the frustration of Jacob. We feel, we feel everything's just in disarray. Everybody's scrambling. Everybody's afraid. Nobody knows what to do. Everybody's trying to organize their, to their best ability. We've got servants running one way. We've got people running back with news. We've, we've just got this whole circumstance. Everything's in an uproar. And now, Jacob turns to prayer, and it changes the whole tone of the scripture. Oh, God of my father Abraham. He reaches back to his history and his heritage. He reaches back to the true reason why that blessing was resting on him, not for his possessions, but because of the authority it brought him in God's presence. There's power. In prayer, there is no substitute for prayer. Can, can we just leave with that lesson learned tonight? There isn't anything that I can organize, plan. There isn't anything that I can prepare, no schedule that I can create that is greater, more important than prayer. That's it. That's, that's, that's all we've got. And prayer. He leans back and he reminds God, he said, The Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. He reminds God of the promise that he gave him. He, he could have reminded Esau it wouldn't have gone anywhere. He could have reminded his men servants, his, his wives. He, he could have reminded everybody that was with him. He, he could have talked to the goats for all I care, but it wouldn't have made one bit of difference. What needed to happen was he needed to talk to God. He needed to spend time in God's presence. He needed to let God know, hey, God, I remember it was you that called me. It was you that reminded me. It was you that told me I'm here because you said to me, go back to that place that you came from. Go back to that land. Go back to your kindred. And I, you, God, you will, will deal well with me. He said, I'm not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother. See, what a difference. Now we're not moving on our own ability. Now we're not relying on our own strength. Now we're not calling all the numbers into being. We're not trying to find out what's in the enemy army. All he's saying is, God, here's what I know. If you'll be with me, if you'll turn the heart of Esau, if you'll turn this thing around, you told 
told me to come this far. I've come this far. And now, God, I'm putting my life back in your hands. It changes everything. I'll tell you why it changes everything. Because there is no substitute for prayer. So I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know what circumstance has you to concern right now. But this is the one thing I know. There's no substitute for prayer. No, Come on, no calendar, no schedule, no planning, no organization, no money, no wealth, no ability that you have, no knowledge that you possess, no shrewdness, nothing that you have can take the place of prayer. All you need to do is get down on your knee and call out and, and say, God, here's what I know. I'm here in this place because you said... There's something powerful that happens when we begin to call on God. I know, I know it's a struggle. I, I was preparing the lesson and I had to step back from preparation. I had to step, step back from, from the organization of the day. I had to step back from playground construction. I had to step back from all that and say, God, I better take my own advice today. I better spend some time in prayer or this lesson isn't going anywhere. This message isn't getting past the pulpit. If we don't spend some time in prayer, I better take some time and talk to you about what you want me to talk to the people about tonight. And let me tell you, that changes everything when we let God in and God will work. There's power. There is no substitute for prayer. Deliver us. He said, for I fear him lest he will come and smite me and the mother of the children. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Jacob leaves that place a different person than the one that was standing, directing servants and assessing his wealth. He leaves a different man in that moment. It's that Jacob, you can scroll through the chapters, it's that Jacob after that moment that wrestles the angel and will not let him go until he receives a blessing. It's that Jacob that after that moment is no longer the one man called Jacob, but rather he's called Israel because he's a prince with God. God's got plans for that man's life. God's got intentions for that man's life. And if you want God to change your future, and if you want God to change your circumstance, and if you want God to change your name, take a moment and spend some time in prayer. It wasn't a long prayer but it was a heartfelt prayer God I'm calling out to you there is no substitute for prayer prayer will change your circumstance prayer will change the heart of your enemy prayer will change the circumstance of your workplace prayer will change the circumstance of your finances prayer will change the circumstance of whatever is happening in your life I'm telling you there's no substitute for prayer Prayer will take you into wrestling with the angel. It will, it will take you into that place of blessing. It will give, give you a strength in your being that you will not let go until you receive what's coming to you from God. That's what happens in prayer. Before Jacob wrestled, he prayed, and that changed everything. Too often we're wrestling, and we haven't prayed, and we give up before the blessing comes. Just a simple lesson tonight. There is... No substitute for prayer. Jacob will walk with a limp. He'll never be the same. But he can walk with the knowledge and the confidence that he has prayed, that he has been with God, and God has changed him. I won't take time to walk through the remainder of the chapter, and you can stand together with me tonight. We're getting ready to close. But if you read down through in Genesis 33 and verse 4, the scripture tells us the very thing that Jacob was most concerned about, that Israel was most concerned about. He meets Esau not as Jacob. He meets him as Israel. And it said, And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him. And they wept. I don't believe that that circumstance would have ended that way if Jacob had not prayed. But because he prayed, it changed everything. It changed Jacob. It changed Esau. And it will change you. Anybody ready to pray tonight? We, we got some things that we need to pray about. And I know, that, I know that NCC, you've been in a season of prayer for the last few days. I'm not trying to take that away. I'm just, we'll just put another block on the fire. But I wonder if you would... Just get a hold of your neighbor for a moment. I wonder if we would pray together and remind God, let your spirit remind us that there is no substitute for prayer. There's no substitute for communion with you. I wonder if you pray together with me. Would you lift your voice? Father, I'm grateful. 
for simple stories in your word. God, that allow us to see clearly. God, what is ours to receive? What is ours to attain? God, what is there waiting for us? God, you wait for us. That moves my heart today. God, that you have a place prepared. And God, you wait for that communion with each one of us. That moment in our day when we push back from duty and responsibility. God, that moment in our day when we recognize the responsibility. God, when we recognize the opportunity that we have in prayer. I I pray, Father, that you would let our voice be mingled, God, with both praise and request. God, I I ask that our voice would be mingled with celebration, God, and concern. I I pray that you would move us to tears in moments of prayer. I, I ask, Father, that you would let intercession God, interrupt our plans in our day. I I pray, God, that you would allow that that power of prayer to be released. God, let it be released in our church. Let it be released in Capital Community Church. I pray that it would be released in Marysville. The, The power of prayer would be released over our city. God, let it be released in our college. I pray for NCC. God, every teacher, every student, God, every every faculty member, we're praying, God, that that power of prayer would change things, that it would transform our surroundings. God, that it would transform our environment. God, that it would transform our our city. Let it stir up a spirit of revival in us, God. God, let it be the directive before we make our plans, before God, we organize our schedules. Father, before we God, we make all of our intentions known. I I pray that we would talk with you about it. God, give us this day. God, give us this day our daily bread. I pray, Father, that this day, today, God, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done. But Father, here's what we know. It won't happen unless we pray. It can't happen. We have got to lay our lives on that altar of prayer. It's got to be laid on that altar of sacrifice. Father, I pray that you would help us. God, help us to die to ourselves. Help us to die to ourselves today and help us to die to ourselves tomorrow. Father, help us to rebuild that altar so prayer will become the central part of our lives, of our days. God, let this lesson be more than just words. God, let it be a catalyst in somebody's spirit. God, let it be a seed that lands in the soil of a heart that's rich and waiting for change. Someone who knows their circumstances are dire. But God, prayer, I pray, let it change. Let it change what's happening in their lives. Let it change what's happening in their families. God, let it change what's happening in their health. Let it change what's happening in their bodies, I pray. That's the power of prayer, God. We release it. God, we release it in our midst. But God, we don't leave it in this room. I pray, Father, let us take it with us. God, I pray that fathers would become pillars in their homes. I pray that moms would become prayer warriors in their place. God, it may be where they pillow their head, but God, let that pillow become a place of prayer. God, I ask today, let our homes be seasoned with prayer. The enemy seeking whom he may devour. He's on the prowl right now. But God, prayer will push him back. Prayer will unlock the door of the prison house. Prayer, God, will open that opportunity. Prayer will do that. I pray, Father, let us see, realize, and release the power of prayer. Would you just pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you for receiving the word of the Lord tonight. Thank you for, I felt, feel that openness in the spirit, that dialogue in the Holy Ghost that happens. I'm grateful for that. 
We just look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to make prayer a priority. Try, try, try the neighbor on the other side. Tell him I'm going to make prayer a priority. I'm going to pray one last prayer before we go. It's going to be simple because the challenge will be that when the reminder comes, that prompting in the Holy Ghost tomorrow, the challenge will be that we act on that every day. Tomorrow and Thursday, tomorrow and Friday. It's been a long day. <laughs> tomorrow and Thursday and Friday. Let's pray together, Jesus. God, I know that your word is released in so many more ways than this podium and this platform. So God, my prayer is that when that seed knocks on the door of someone's heart tomorrow or Friday or Saturday, God, I pray that that place that someone is determining right now, that place that they're going to pray, that time that they're going to pray, Father, I pray that that invitation will be so clear and so, God, so loud in their ear that they won't be able to ignore it. I pray that they have the courage to follow hard after it. And God, that time spent in your presence, God, nothing else can be a substitute for that. God, I pray that your power will be released. And God, I ask on behalf of every leader in their lives today that you would allow things to change so they know that prayer truly does work. I give you thanks. We pray it in your name, in Jesus' name. Someone say, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you're dismissed tonight. God bless you. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord with you all. Amen.